Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so it is my honor to introduce the next panel on competition and cooperation in security ideas and rules. Uh, China and the United States are competing on multiple fronts as we've been hearing. Uh, China is challenging the United States long held role as predominant Indo-Pacific power. Is competition inevitable? How can the two sides avoid a hot war? Uh, so to debate, to, de to debate and discuss these questions, we have a terrific panel of experts. Our moderator is Graham Allison, professor of government at the Harvard Kennedy School and author of the book, as you all know, Destined for War, who has done plenty of thinking about US-China security issues. And our speakers are Andrew Erickson, professor of strategy and research director in the Naval War College's China Maritime Studies Institute, Taylor Fravel, Professor in the Department of Political Science and Director of the Security Studies Program at MIT, Joseph Nye, University Distinguished Professor Emer Emeritus and former Dean, Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. And finally, Jessica Chen Weiss, Professor of Government at Cornell University, who recently wrote a very important piece in Foreign Affairs urging the US to pull back from zero sum competition with China. So over to you, Graham, thank you. So thank you very much. And thanks for the organizers for putting together such an extraordinary conference. As I understand my instructions from Mark and Tony and Susan, it is to be the moderator, that is to try to make our members stay, or the members of our panel uh, stay within two, question, two minutes in answering brief questions and uh, be provocative with the first two or three questions before we go to the audience. The topic uh, is described in your program. If I took time to uh, give an adequate introduction to each member of the panel, we would have no time for the conversation. So you can read about them. If you don't know about them, you probably came to the wrong meeting. Uh, so I wanna just jump, jump right in. And I, again, let me also say, uh, what great timing uh, folks had. Uh, who knew, uh, you already knew that Bali was gonna happen. You probably could have predicted that there would be a bilateral, uh, but it was uh, to, to some degree uncertain. And you certainly would not likely have gotten all the contours of it. Though I think uh, obviously a timely meeting for a timely topic. So let me start with, uh, with a hard question. So, uh, Back in 2012, she was just becoming president. And I was trying to learn about China and had the great good fortune to have as a mentor, Lee Kuan Yew, the world's, I think, premier China watcher. And one of the questions that I were that was live at the time was, well, what about Xi's ambitions? And uh, if you would ask most China experts in the West at the time and in the intelligence community otherwise, and uh, the question, are, are she and his counterparts serious about displacing the US as the predominant power in Asia in their lifetimes? You know, and I mean, is that a really realistic objective for them? Uh, you would get the answer, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's complicated, blah, 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 okay? Uh, so I just asked Lee Kuan Yew this question and actually, uh, in that little book that Blackwell and I did with Q and A's with, with him, we put the question. So I say to him, you know, uh, uh, is she or she and his colleagues serious about displacing the U.S. as the predominant power in Asia in the foreseeable future? As he would do when he thought somebody had asked a really dumb question, he would sort of look at you incredulously. His eyes would widen, and he said. And then he would actually answer directly. And he said, quote, of course, why not? Who could imagine otherwise? Why would they not aspire to be number one in Asia and in time the world? So question one, agree or disagree with Lee Kuan Yew's judgment today <laughs> and why? And then the first question will go this way. And the second question will start with with a question from Jessica's foreign affairs piece that was already mentioned and go that away. So Andrew, less than two minutes. <laughs> Graham, uh, thanks uh, thanks for this. Appreciate the chance to share uh, solely my personal views. 
Um, I think uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew was uh, fundamentally onto something, uh, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, leadership and uh, ambitions. Um, he has announced uh, extremely ambitious goals uh, going out to 2027, 2035, and 2049. Uh, it's the grandest and most strategic plan that any great power has today. I think that's for sure. What's worrying about it to me is that uh, under his uh, leadership and uh, under his guidance, uh, the PLA is, and China's armed forces more broadly are pursuing uh, the centennial military building goal of 2027. Uh, this looks in its actual manifestation uh, like a relentless ramp up to give a rather complete uh, tool set for having military options vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, which he refuses to uh, renounce. And uh, more broadly, uh, he is challenging the rules-based order and some of the key elements of the fabric of the international uh, system Forty-five, different from pre-1945. In uh, an international uh, effort to uh, limit the use of force to resolve sovereignty disputes, uh, most importantly at the level of conquering and annexing internationally peaceful free societies. Uh, now uh, Putin, uh, uh, in control of Russia, has reopened uh, very badly that terrible Pandora's box vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and Xi Jinping is leading a military ramp up that appears designed to achieve increasing capabilities to threaten to do so and potentially to do so vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. So I'm fundamentally with uh, Lee Kuan Yew's overall assessment and uh, I take uh, an internationally focused uh, interpretation of what I felt I was hearing from professors David Shambaugh and Susan Shirk uh, in that I see uh, under Xi Jinping a neo-totalitarian system, that would be one way to put it, that is engaged in a dangerous overreach with, as I see it, a few acceptances or credible commitments to uh, durable constraints uh, in guard and guardrails. In short, I'm uh, tremendously concerned. Good, I think they made it in two minutes. So a good example for our panel, uh, Taylor. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Graham, uh, and thanks to the organizers for having me participate today. So uh, in response to your question, I guess I would say the following. It doesn't surprise me that a regional power, power would want to be a regional hegemon. I think most regional powers would aspire to be a regional hegemon. So in that sense, the goal is, is not that uh, puzzling. Um, and we would see this in different parts of the world in different points in history. So the question, I think, before us is, uh, how quickly is China trying to achieve this objective and at what cost, right? Because to extrude the United States from the region uh, is not a simple matter. Uh, the U.S. is a major economic power uh, in East Asia today and more uh, fundamentally uh, is also uh, a major military power in the region uh, through its alliances with South Korea, with Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, and Thailand. Uh, and if anything, the alliances are sort of growing stronger uh, and they're tightening. Uh, we uh, saw most recently uh, the trilateral agreement between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States uh, called AUKUS uh, to build uh, nuclear-powered submarines, but really it's a framework for much broader military cooperation. And so China may have this goal, uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to confront a wide array of challenges in order to be able to achieve it. And if we take a sort of a traditional sort of international relations uh, sort of definition of hegemony to be the only major military power in the region, um, then China to achieve that goal is gonna have to find a way to push the United States out, right? Uh, and I think that's gonna be really difficult. The US will not go willingly. Um, uh, the US allies will not want the US to leave. Um, and if anything, uh, trends are sort of pushing uh, in the opposite direction. So I think we're gonna see more, more of a new military balance forming that China that China is going to find uh, pretty difficult um, to manage, although, it, as Andrew noted, uh, its capabilities are increasing and it has a very set of um, ambitious uh, sort of modernization uh, objectives, but it's a complicated region, lots of 
unresolved disputes, uh, even especially Taiwan, before one uh, considers the broader sort of question of the U.S. presence. And then, of course, uh, uh, other countries in the region have a say. Do they want the United States uh, to leave or not? And so, so again, hegemony, dominance, of course, if you can get it, why not? How much are you going to pay for it? How hard is it going to be to achieve? I think in the case of East Asia today, it's not a simple matter. And so he was right, but he didn't really <laughs> he didn't really say how you're going to get from A to B. And I think that's that's a really that's important. Further question. along in the chapter, but we won't go there right now. So, uh, Joe, you've thought about this question over many uh, decades, and uh, looking at it in 2022. Lee Kuan Yew, right? Well, well, it's always dangerous to disagree with Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, <laughs> I think he's the quote you have is actually right, Graham. But I also had a conversation with him a year or two after that. And I said, not do you want to, but can you? And Lee Kuan Yew's answer was, the Chinese can mobilize the talents of it was then uh, 1.3 billion people. Uh, but the U.S. can mobilize the talents of what was then 7 billion people. And he said, what's more, the U.S. can recombine these talents with a diversity and creativity that ethnic Han nationalism can ever achieve. I thought that was interesting because it, it not only complements your quote, but it also tells us that when we're thinking of a strategy to respond, the great danger is uh, what, if to take the title of uh, Susan's book, is overreach equals overreact. So to underestimate or to overestimate your opponent is equally dangerous. And I think right now we're in the business of overestimating. And it's led to, I think, a somewhat overreactive and not totally coherent policy. Um, why do I think that the future uh, that Lee Kuan Yew is right? Um, I think that if you look at what's going on uh, with China's long-term trends, we heard this morning the short-term problems of zero COVID and you know what people are talking about, the property markets and so forth. But if you look at long-term trends over 10, 15 years, China's suffering demographic decline the labor force peaked in 2015, and the shape of the population pyramid is one where more and more old people uh, are going to be supported by fewer and fewer young workers. The second thing you notice about the long-term trends is that uh, the answer that most people would give on uh, to declining labor is use technology, robots replace people kind of thing. And China is certainly, in, and she in particular, certainly put a lot of emphasis on technology. But there's a problem, which is whether the secret is a highly centralized government investment in a particular technology, or whether it's the diffusion of technology in the society, which really gives you productivity. I think there's a good deal of evidence that it's the latter. And then you come to the third problem of Xi Jinping's China, which we heard about this morning, which is um, it, it, a lot of this diffusion of technology depends not on government bureaucracy, but on the private sector. And instead, what Xi is doing is emphasizing state-owned enterprises. And you could argue that what he's doing is killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. So as I look at the long-term trends, I not only agree with the first proposition that uh, Graham mentioned of Lee Kuan Yew's, but I think I agree with his second proposition that he told me. Good, good. Jessica, agree, disagree, and come in. Thanks. I think Taylor really well covered some of the challenges that China will face regionally. And so I wanted to focus maybe in discussing the second part of the statement, which is whether and to what extent China will seek to become the a predominant global power and replace the United States um, as the unipolar power. And here, I think I would refer you to the, uh, the threat assessment um, provided by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for 2022, where uh, it states that the CCP will continue efforts to achieve President Biden, I'm oh, sorry, President Xi Jinping's vision of making China the preeminent power in East Asia and a major power on the world stage. And I think that the real question here is whether or not the struggle between the United States and China will uh, result in some form of 
coexistence 2.0, or whether, in fact, uh, the two sides need to be locked in a, a zero-sum battle uh, for uh, world uh, hegemony or, or preeminence. And so in my view, I think that that uh, remains an open question. I don't think that um, a, a country's strategic intentions are ever, uh, you know, etched in stone, certainly not something that was, uh, you know, written down secretly, hidden away. Um, and indeed, in between um, the stated aspirations, which set out a direction for indeed world class leadership, preeminence, et cetera, there's a key uh, question as to what form that might take, uh, to what extent these are mutually exclusive uh, visions of international leadership. Uh, and then to what extent might we indeed find terms of coexistence um, between these two uh, views? Okay, let me do one more round on this one before I do uh, Jessica's question. Uh, but uh, so as we try to think about this, I think Taylor's proposition is that uh, why wouldn't a regional power seek to be a regional hegemon? And especially if it's a rising power, if it's becoming stronger. Uh, so I try to put this against a historical canvas. And I ask about, uh, let's say, for example, the rise of the US at the beginning of the 20th century and Teddy Roosevelt and what he thought about uh, there being foreigners in our hemisphere, as he put it. So why was Spain uh, dominating Cuba? What were the British and the Germans doing to, trying to settle a territorial dispute in Venezuela. Uh, why uh, shouldn't he take another bite of Alaska uh, or of Canada to add it to Alaska? So if I look at this against in a, on a historical canvas, uh, doesn't it seem quite normal that if it has China becomes bigger and stronger, it'll seek to be more influential in its region. Let's just take the region to start with. And then the, the fact is there's some other major powers there and that the US thinks of itself also and is an Asian power and a Pacific power. So that makes it slightly more complicated, but British thought they were a Western hemispheric power. They had been for a hundred years. And that was how we had freedom of the sea. Okay? The US had no capacity to do, to do that. So how much of this is baked into the structure of geopolitics and how much is peculiar to China? Or another way to think about this, if Teddy Roosevelt were consulting with, Lee, with, uh, with Xi Jinping, would he say, why are you being so assertive? Or would he say, why are you being so cautious or so timid? So Andrew? Well, I, th I think there's some uh, some critical uh, historical changes that make today very different from that era without even going into the Roosevelt corollary and some other important uh, nuances to that discussion. Um, the post-1945 international order is fundamentally different. I think that's extremely important, and we should never go back. There are many reasons I need not enumerate here. Second of all, if we're going to talk about uh, international politics and security and things that have shaped that in the post-1945 era, certainly nuclear weapons are also extremely important. So against that backdrop, I don't, I don't think uh, that there is a, a legitimate or a practical basis for the PRC under Xi Jinping to cite previous historical patterns of great powers arguably throwing their weight around to say that China should have the same rights or breathing room or something like that uh, to do it today. And I think it's very important to prevent that Pandora's box from being further and further opened. The international system is riddled with tragedy and inconsistencies, but overall we're far better off uh, with the post-1945 world, we've built with so much blood, treasure, institutions, and frankly, various means of deterrence. So I don't think there's a durable and compelling historical analog that survives that transition, nor should there be. And I think 
American efforts to prevent that terrible Pandora's box from opening widely are largely uh, supported in uh, the East Asian and Indo-Pacific region. And it gets back to the issue of alliances and partnerships and also uh, military uh, development and, and balancing or hedging against a perceived rapid uh, meteoric buildup in Chinese uh, PRC military power that we've seen. Taylor, you, yeah, so you started this. So. I started this. Um, um, I'll, I'll keep at it. Uh, uh, so nu nuclear weapons was the first thing I was going to say. This is a very different world. Uh, setting aside everything else, I mean, if Britain had nuclear weapons in the 19th century, like would they really have left? Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, or uh, what, how hard would it have been get them to leave? I'm not so sure. So um, we have to understand not only were are we in a nuclear era, but of course, the US provides extended deterrent guarantees to a number of the allies uh, in the region as well. Second factor I would point to would be the kind of complexity of China's regional environment, right? It has 14 neighbors, neighbors on land. Uh, it has eight or however you want to define it at sea, um, right? It, it consciously has to always balance in its own terms, different strategic directions, north, south, east, west. I mean, this is a very complicated environment with which to achieve hegemony, especially if you have another major military power who's present uh, in the region. I, I'm just not sure what what Teddy Roosevelt tells us about that. The U.S., a very benign strategic environment, two oceans uh, as neighbors, um, um, you know, uh, two oceans as buffers, two neighbors, um, not as much, you know, sort of to worry about it as China does. And so, so I think what we are probably going to see is, I mean, the military power component is very important, but I think China is going to focus more in terms of increasing regional influence, in terms of using that military power to backstop its sort of diplomatic and economic initiatives. But I think it's the economy that's really going to be the most important element uh, with which it uh, seeks to sort of increase influence in the region. But that uh, is, is something that uh, has changed over time and is improving, but will also take a sort of more uh, time to come. So I think there are just a lot of differences from, from the earlier period. And, um, I know history doesn't repeat, it might rhyme. I'm not sure how much it rhymes in this Good. particular context. Joseph. Yeah, all historical metaphors have similarities and differences. The problem with uh, the Teddy Roosevelt example is alliance structure. Lord Salisbury's Britain was worried about the rise of Germany. They needed an American ally, despite the outrageous things that Teddy Roosevelt did. Graham and I go fishing together in a place in Southern Alaska, where Teddy Roosevelt rigged an international commission to get a chunk of British, what would otherwise be British Columbia for the US. However, the Brits put up with that because essentially they were worried about Germany and they were about the US. Transfer that then, that alliance question to East Asia. Susan <laughs> mentioned that I once said only China can contain China. Well, they're doing a pretty good job of it. Um, if you look at the structure of alliances in East Asia, the world's third largest economy, Japan, is much tighter with the U.S. today than it was 20 years ago. And we now have the Quad, which includes India, uh, which uh, previously was very delicate about even meeting, which is now met several times in person. And if you look at the Jaucus uh, or, or the AUKUS deal and the, the uh, questions of bringing Australia into this, you see that China has done a pretty good job of creating alliances against itself and is doing a pretty good job of containing itself. And if you say, okay, but you know, they've, there's Belt and Road and there's the attractiveness of China. Well, look at China's soft power. When you go to the Pew polls, the international polls are most reputable, and you ask, which countries do you see as favorable? And Xi Jinping has said that he needs to increase China's soft power. It looks like, by all the polling I've seen, that the US is far more attractive to all other countries in East Asia than China is. And that uh, it's going to be very hard for China to change that because of the reasons that Taylor just said. If you have disputes with a good number of your neighbors, including India and the Himalayas or various things in the South China Sea, uh, it's very hard to put up a Confucius Institute in New Delhi and make yourself attractive if Chinese soldiers are killing Indians on the border. 
So I, I both the alliance structure and the soft power issue, I would say that, that we can't go back to Teddy Roosevelt. Jesse, anything less comment on this one? Yeah, just building upon those excellent comments, I would say that, uh, you know, the, as Jonathan Kirshner pointed out in his recent book, An Unwritten Future, the dr drive to seek regional hegemony rather than just leadership or preeminence would be the only thing that would actually uh, derail China and, uh, you know, pose a fundamental threat uh, to its security, much in the way that we have just described this, uh, you know, China containing itself by provoking uh, this concerted reaction uh, around it. And I would just say on, on the lessons of history and what the structure of international politics requires, obviously there are important uh, structural drivers and historical analogies, but nonetheless, I think we risk um, overstating uh, their predictive power. And in fact, if we rely too much on them, uh, I think we tend to neglect our own agency the end, certainly the agency of leaders uh, in Beijing to choose a wiser path uh, that avoids uh, such an, a conflict. Okay, let me uh, you know, turn the panel back around to the policy front. Jessica, some of most of you probably know, spent a year on the policy planning staff, which he left recently. And after leaving, uh, wrote a foreign affairs piece that was mentioned uh, about the Biden strategy for uh, addressing the China challenge. And if I, apologies, if I quote here, uh, U.S. politicians and policymakers are becoming so focused on countering China that they risk losing sight of the affirmative interests and values that should underpin U.S. strategy. The current course will not just bring indefinite deterioration of the U.S.-Chinese relationship and a growing danger of catastrophic conflict. It also threatens to undermine the sustainability of American leadership in the world and the vitality of American society and democracy at home. So let me start by saying, Jessica, any second thoughts or comments? <laughs> and then uh, we're going to go down the panel this way. The question again is agree or disagree and two minutes to explain why. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, let me provide a slight corrective to your description of the piece, which was not aimed as a critique directly of the Biden administration's policy, rather of the broad thrust uh, in American foreign policy, which really predated the Biden administration, starting with the Trump administration. And I would say that the dynamic that you just described, this tendency to define success in terms of defeating China or standing up to China, that is much more pronounced on Capitol Hill. I would say that the Biden administration and its national security strategy very clearly emphasize the importance of stating what we are for, not just what we are against. Um, but I would say that there are two different muscles, I would say, in uh, you know, U.S. foreign policy instincts. And one of them uh, is to uh, you know, defeat the rival. Um, and the other one is to drive toward uh, something, a future that we want to see, not just for our peoples, but for the world. And if anything, this essay was an effort to really create more space and more attention toward uh, making sure that beneath these words of, um, sort of an inclusive, free and open uh, world that we seek to create and lead, um, that we make sure that the actions that we take are also lined up in support of that vision. Um, and so while competition is not going to go away, my hope is that it could be over time disciplined in service of that, um, so that the actions that we take are always aligned with, with those principles. Okay, Josh, agree, disagree, uh, apply. I read Jessica's article with uh, great appreciation. I, I, I agree it about 99%, maybe 99.9% .9 with what she wrote. And it, 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 she wrote it for the uh, Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. I wrote an article in, that's in the September issue of the Journal of Chatham House, which is called International Affairs rather than Foreign Affairs. And I gave it a provocative title, which was How Not to Deal with the Rising China. And basically it says what she says, but in a, in a, I, she was in the administration, so she has to be a little bit more careful when she says, I'm saying that uh, basically we're overreacting. And um, I, I feel that uh, we've used metaphors related to fear and to structural uh, inevitability too much. And we're putting ourselves into a situation where as somebody put it earlier, you're going to have a 
I guess it was our two Chinese professors, you're going to have a major disruption when a Speaker McCarthy or whoever is in his place decides that he'll lead a delegation to Taiwan that's even larger than Nancy Pelosi's delegation. Uh, that kind of overreaction in Washington, we talk about a bipartisan consensus on China. Yes, but no. And I think uh, I'd much rather have a bipartisan consensus along the lines of Jessica's article or my article than what we're seeing. Taylor? Um, <clears throat> uh, largely agree. I mean, I think the only point I would add is, you know, the, the administration and a lot of the public commentary on what it's doing in China, you know, and sometimes I think repeating the challenges of the previous administration, which was viewing confrontation as an end in itself rather than a means to something else, or viewing competition as an end in itself rather than a means to something else. And so I, there's not yet quite the, the vision of sort of what the future will sort of look like and how we're going to mobilize these competitive tools. And so it's very easy to build support for, you know, becoming McCarthy um, visit, right, in the April recess, which is going to probably precipitate a really you know, significant crisis. And the reason why I, I think many of us are concerned about that now is because we don't necessarily see um, the relationship in a place uh, where uh, something like that can be kind of effectively sort of um, managed uh, in part because it's sort of the the narrative as it sort of exists in Washington that undergirds the bipartisan consensus doesn't leave a lot of room for more nuance and thinking what well, you know how might we approach something like this right um what would what would sort of the administration actually do would it would it actually encourage uh, taiwan not to invite mccarthy right to preempt it um or would it uh, not want to incur the wrath of congress leading into the, the next election right and sort of say well this is this is you know this is co-equal branches of government and so on and so forth it just has to happen and you have to deal with it and so so i, I think we're still kind of missing this the sort of sense of what our goals are that we can then assess our policies against. And you know, in the national security strategy that, gosh, I mean, it was two years, I mean, it came out so late. Um, but the, the 11th edition, the 11th, and it or was 11th revision, like yes. three times. But I think there was one, one or two mentions of peaceful coexistence with China, but no description of what that uh, actually means. Um, and so, so I think we're in a very challenging, um, situation um, going forward. Andrew? I'll be the first to say, I think it's a very uh, sad state of affairs, but um, when I look at what uh, came out of uh, Bali and uh, bilateral discussions and the readouts, I don't see a basis for, for deep cooperation. I'm sad to say that, but um, I, I, don't, I don't see evidence that China under Xi would be willing to accommodate, make the most of first move or make a major credible agreement in any, in any particular era, area. In fact, uh, some agreements under, uh, under uh, have been uh, particularly not uh, respected or honored under Xi. Uh, look at the Look at the treaty enshrined uh, commitments vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong. Look at the pledges to the Obama administration regarding cyber, uh, South China Sea. Uh, look at China's own uh, uh, own agreements with with Ukraine. Unfortunately, we're just not in a uh, in a in a credible place. Uh, I think the administration has articulated some very positive, uh, broad visions, inclusive visions, and is actively advancing them. Uh, look at President Biden's uh, energetic attendance uh, at COP27. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, sadly, was a no-show, and China's doubling down on coal, which is just about the worst uh, approach uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the climate. And bringing it back into this room, I would, I would ask anyone to correct me, but in today's PRC under Xi, I don't think there's any equivalent to a high profile uh, conf uh, conference like ours today uh, with a concluding panel on the subject of toward coexistence 2.0. What should China do? 
And I think that's a large source of the inability to have a positive, shared, productive, uh, uh, even, even just a, a, a clear-eyed set of uh, durable, credible arms control negotiations, such as the US and the Soviet Union were capable of to great effect in the latter stages of the Cold War. That's part of the concern I have this seemingly reflexive uh, official PRC uh, invocation of the trope of a Cold War mentality. Well, I think US-China relations might be better if we could at least have a late Cold War mentality on arms control. China will not sub submit itself to any meaningful arms control agreements by meaningful that actually constrains, constrains China. China already has a wide range of military superlatives, including the world's largest and most formidable conventional ballistic missile force. Is China willing to enter into negotiations to uh, even discuss that? Not to not no evidence that I can see. That's partly why the INF Treaty collapsed. Uh, Russia wouldn't honor it. China wouldn't even talk about joining it. Uh, so uh, the U.S. wouldn't unilaterally tie its uh, hands anymore. So I think, sadly, the historical analogy here that's apt is uh, a structural pattern we see in both the pre-1945 and the post-1945 eras. That is, there's a certain life cycle of great powers in terms of rapidity of development, and then it sows the seeds of its own slowing, even though arguably society is better off for having its needs better addressed. And this is the critical decade, what the Biden administration calls the decisive decade, what I call the decade of maximum danger for US-China relations. Under Xi Jinping, a peaking Xi Jinping, a peaking PRC in terms of relative power, a peaking Chinese Communist Party in terms of relative ability to mobilize resources for repression at home and abroad. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But as China slows down across the board in national power, there will finally be the basis for what might broadly be called more of a, a geriatric piece in the slowing common to, uh, common to great powers. We need to get through this challenging decade, and then there'll be time for catch-up cooperation when uh, Chinese society or priorities have significantly uh, realigned to invest in and address the inequalities uh, that Professor Lei rightly referred to. The rapid demographic aging has been mentioned by many. Uh, that will be finally the place for cooperation, but this will be the difficult decade to get to that place. And in the meantime, I see very little prospect for meaningful, credible, sustainable cooperation and commitment under Xi Jinping. I'm very sad to say that, but I think it's the honest truth. I'm tempted to become a panelist rather than the moderator, but I will resist. I'll only say first, uh, Peking is a very uh, odd uh, analogy and concept. And anybody that wants to understand Peking should look at peak oil predictions for the last seven decades, which have regularly been offered and never been fulfilled. Oil has peaked in the 1940s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, okay? Uh, so that's the first proposition. Second proposition, I think, uh, Andrew, while I agree with much of what you're saying, the proposition about China sitting down for arms control, particularly with respect to, say, strategic nuclear arms, which the Trump administration sought, is the proposition that says, you have 400 weapons, I have 5,000. I think we should sit down and agree on a freeze. Anybody that would go to that poker game would be uh, unusual, particularly if I figure I have a GDP approximately equivalent to yours. So why should I sit at a table without enough cards to play? And I would say that was a foolish, uh, a foolish aspiration and it produced predictable responses, even a little bit of incentive to expand your arsenal so that if you ever got to a table, you would have more to play with, okay? But and as, as a matter of concern. So I think uh, thirdly, uh, it, I, I see this as two set of uh, compelling, contradictory imperatives. 
in terms of the overall relationship. On the one hand, uh, geopolitically, this is destined to be the fiercest rivalry we've seen historically, I believe, okay, I, I suspect. Secondly, on the other hand, and it really matters who is successful because as you say, the international order and the rules that we would like to live under. On the other hand, uh, we coexist or we or co-inhabit a very small globe in which in the absence of some degree of coordination and cooperation, we can't even have a biosphere we can live in because of greenhouse gas emissions. If we have a nuclear war, we end up with our own society destroyed. Pandemics don't have passports or viruses. Uh, nuclear proliferation is something in which we both have a considerable stake to certainly stop short of nuclear anarchy. So I think it's the the uh, the attempt to try to deal with absolutely compelling contradictory imperatives. Scott Fitzgerald calls this the test of a first class mind, to hold two contradictory ideas in your head at the same time and still function. So I think the question is, could Biden and she do that? I think maybe. Okay. Could two governments do that? And two polit polities, particularly ours, as well as theirs, I'm more dubious. So that's my two cents, but we're going to the audience now for questions. There's, I don't know, there's one microphone here, and I think there's another one over here. Introduce yourself. Uh, can make a short statement uh, and then a question with a question mark, please. And it can be to the whole panel or to somebody in particular, if you have a particular point of agreement or disagreement with one of the panelists. Uh, thank you for the panel and uh, uh, my name is Ming Ye. I teach at Boston University. Are you get so, closer? Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, 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 the Chinese uh, strategic discussion. So I, I'm kind of a junkie that read the Chinese documents a lot uh, from 2019 to 2021. Uh, when uh, China, China's, I think those, this most prominent proposition is uh, decentralization, uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, 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 that kind of captures their strategic uh, moves in the region and, and globally. And recently at the APEC summit uh, yesterday, uh, uh, she, uh, President Xi Jinping wrote a, a letter saying that the uh, Pacific is no one's backyard, no great power competition will be, um, will be tolerated. So, so I want to get to your reaction. This, uh, this uh, uh, number one, is this China's new strategy, uh, and, and the no great power policy in the neighborhood, uh, sufficient to uh, uh, have a more stable uh, external relationship in the region? And uh, two is does that uh, offer a uh, possibility for US-China cooperation beyond uh, strategic and military arena? Thank you. Good. Thank you. I'll take a Jessica. shot. Jessica. So I th thanks, Min. Uh, I think that, that statement, I think, squares well with um, China's long-term emphasis on the sort of so-called democratization of international politics of of resisting, uh, you know, hegemonism. Um, and so I don't know about seeing that as necessarily the centerpiece. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have to see what what follows it. Um, but nonetheless, I do think that in as China moves forward to champion its version of reform of the global governance system, um, I will look to see, you know, to, you know, to what extent um, that is is borne out in in terms of um, trying to decenter any particular uh, great power or even that kind of that rivalry. I, I do see that the, you know, the actions and the statements that led to the the summit at, at the G20, um, you know, the the declaration as well as the bilateral uh, meetings that were held as as being a you know a relatively positive sign. Um, I know that those who've you know watched Chinese domestic politics closely you know came out of the 20th Party Congress as we heard here um, seeing a much more a dogmatic and flexible and potentially uh, aggressive China. I I personally find a hard time squaring that analysis with what we have recently seen. It may just be tactical, but nonetheless the kind of flexibility, the kind of 
smiling but steely uh, face that she put forward at the G20, I think we're going to likely see more of that to come, um, which is, uh, you know, a, a little bit different from the wolf warrior tone that we have seen. I wouldn't say that it's going to be gone, of course, but the idea of struggle, struggle to what end? Struggle to coexist, to force the United States to accept China as a respected peer on the international stage. I would like to see, hope to see that's where that's headed, um, but we'll have to see. Thanks. Anybody else want to come in on that? And I would offer uh, Xi Jinping's uh, interaction with uh, Justin Trudeau in Bali. <laughs> And, and, and Andrew, I don't want to be too ordinary here, but I would say that was uh, attempting to remind people that if you can't have a private conversation, you're not going to have another private conversation with me. Okay, please. Go on, Bajali. Investment banker, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you need to get close to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Arlan Bajali. Uh, I am currently an investment banker. I uh, have worked with a lot of state-backed enterprises over the course of my career, particularly in the energy sector. Um, thank you so much for your time. Two questions, both short, uh, building on each other. The first one being, I really appreciated the historical canvas um, point that you made. However, I guess if I take the two uh, issues that you offer of geopolitics versus maybe China idiosyncrasy in terms of outward expansion. I guess question one is perhaps is another apt explanation for this outward move ideology, ideological entrenchment and exaltment. And building off of that, going back to the first talk um, where some of our speakers talked about um, macro issues and particularly economic securitization um, being more important to this this cooperation than leadership, does the ideological point perhaps supersede that and have scary implications? Well, let me take a, a first cut at that. I, I mean, I'll belie my uh, sort of background as someone trained in international relations, or we tend to downplay the role of ideology. Um, but, but I think in terms of foreign policy, uh, obviously ideology is very important in China uh, overall, right? It's core to it's the way that the system works. But I think at least you have a tradition in foreign policy where that's not played as much of a role, um, right? You see uh, China engaging um, all kinds of countries with all different kinds of ideological backgrounds and primarily is focused on pursuing whatever uh, specific uh, interest it has, uh, like with that particular set of countries. Um, now, I think lately, right, China's, you know, uh, sort of talked at various points about the, the China model or the sort of hinting that, that or suggesting that, right, it's uh, sort of state-led capitalist approach is something that others might be able to replicate its ways of controlling, um, you know, smart cities and, and 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 policing and things might be things other others can replicate. I see those more as kind of uh, methods of control than an ideology sort of writ large as like a way in which you're going to structure your political life. Um, but generally speaking, I think China's taken a pretty flexible approach to with whom it has diplomatic relations, with whom it develops diplomatic relations, and that's based upon the sort of underlying kind of uh, fundamental uh, it, interest that it has. And so I see ideology in that sense playing very, very much kind of a secondary uh, role to the degree that it plays a role um, and, and not, not a primary role. And you can just look at the diversity of relationships that China has to see where, where, where if you're making an ideological argument, I think it would be hard to square why, why China engages um, very sort of significantly such a diverse a range of states. I think instead it's just being quite pragmatic and trying to see where it can um, improve ties and, and sort of gain advantage. Please. Andy Zalecki, Harvard Business School. Can any of you uh, flesh out just a little bit with a little particularity the end game that you think Washington ought to be playing for that you think Beijing could plausibly accept? Thank you. Sorry, the the end game that Washington is playing for, that Beijing might live with. Okay, George? I'll I'll take a crack at it, Andy. Um, the if you take the formal statements of of the Biden administration, 
they are, in fact, maybe Jessica should answer this, but they are to talk about a uh, cooperative, competitive relationship. And uh, the title of this panel is Coexistent 2.0, but I think what we heard this morning from our Chinese professors was that the word coexistence 2.0 sounds too much like Cold War. And you do find some people in Washington who make Cold War analogies. It's one of the things I warn against this article I mentioned. But uh, we haven't really articulated, to my mind, a, a, a overarching concept, uh, something like containment was in the, in the real Cold War. Uh, I personally like Kevin Rudd's uh, term, uh, managed competition. Um, and I think what we've seen so far is much more on the competition and not enough on the managed. Though Bali may begin to change that, even if Kevin McCarthy uh, manages to reverse it in a few months. <laughs> but, the, but I think that idea of, of a managed competition is interesting and important. So I think the, an Australian has said it better than, than Washington. Let me, let me just say that uh, on terminology, we don't get too fixated on terminology, but I don't think we've done as good a job at this end of expressing what we want as we should. Um, the basic proposition, I think, is that the US does not pose an existential threat to China. China does not pose an existential threat to the US. This is not like Nazi Germany or Stalin Soviet Union. And that's why the title of our panel, Coexistence 2.0, uh, makes sense, except for the fact that our Chinese interlocutors this morning don't like it. Well, so I, I would go back to Kevin Rudd's uh, managed competition with a bit more emphasis on the managed. Sure, thanks. Um, I think it's going to be important but tricky, and it's going to have to look at multiple different domains, coexistence, and what's the end game is going to vary, I think, by domain. Um, I would say that the United States does not pose an existential threat to China, and that China does not pose an existential threat to the United States yet, but I worry about the direction of competition um, leading to increased insecurity on both sides, um, not just in the military domain, which we've been talking about, or regional alliances, but also in terms of you know, the integrity of our, our democracy. And of course, they have uh, similar concerns on, on the other side. Um, and so to my mind, um, you know, a potential form of coexistence could look like um, you know, a renewed emphasis on the United Nations, the Westphalian um, basis of the UN Charter, um, you know, reinforced you know, bounds around um, the sovereignty, uh, non-interference, um, of these uh, equal states. But of course, that's not enough. That's sort of the lowest common denominator. And so when you think about the rules based, so called rules based international order, not as a single order, but about many nested orders, could we think about having both the kind of fit for purpose coalitions that drive forward higher standards or quality standards in various areas, but also an equal uh, effort to drive forward and kind of revitalize some of the encompassing institutions that have, I think, to date really stagnated or been paralyzed by a growing geopolitical rivalry. I would say the United States is not a status quo power. Uh, we have not been since the Trump administration, um, and I would say continuing uh, today, there are questions about, you know, to what extent the United States wants to support and reinvigorate, not just in name, but in um, deed, um, the various institutions that have, um, you know, long brought, I think, a measure of stability uh, to the world. And so I think when I think about what is it the future that we want, it also has to be across the board, you know, what, where are we going to reinvest, uh, and also not just reinvest, but reform, because um, unfortunately, I think that part of the reason that China has been so successful um, and tapping into the resentments of much of the world is that the system is a little bit outdated. Um, it hasn't been uh, kind of reformed to reflect uh, sort of you know changes um, in in the in the balance of of power and influence around the world. And so, while this may not be a vision of you know cooperation, I would not. I would say that the function of these institutions is also to regulate conflict, to prevent the kind of dangers. Um, that that Andrew forecasts, and so um, you know you might think about progress as either being more cooperation, but also you know reducing the risk of really a catastrophe um, that would really render today's world, I think, um, you know, unimaginable.
Andrew, quick. I don't unfortunately think a UN approach will work because look how China and Russia are cooperating to undermine those very principles of state sovereignty, such as Ukraine, a sovereign, indisputably sovereign nation. And when we talk about managing, the question is how to manage, who will manage, on what basis? And I think there we we run into the fundamental problem. I at least have yet to see an argument that the U.S. should accommodate, enter into some sort of management agreement approach discussion. I have yet to see such an argument that comes with any evidence that China itself will actually accommodate. In, in, in what area? Uh, can anyone name one specific credible example? I can't, I have yet to hear one. Okay, good. Uh, let me drill just a little further on this topic for a second. We have 10 minutes left and we're gonna to get to the questions, but on the question of uh, a quote, existential threat that you put Joe, which I generally agree with, but <clears throat> if I try to ask about the current course of events, uh, so there was the Pelosi visit. There was a predictable Chinese response. There's likely to be a McCarthy visit. There will be a predictable Chinese, another big slice of moving closer and closer to uh, demonstrating a capacity to create a blockade around or a, a, a noose around uh, Taiwan. Uh, in the politics of the US today, Republicans and Democrats continue jumping a, to the right of each other to see who can be tougher on China, whatever advice this panel or anybody else offers. And I would say that's baked into the dynamics of the democratic process that we're watching here between now and 2024, 25. So uh, Mendez, uh, the democratic chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and Lindsey Graham put in the Taiwan Policy Act that they were proposing to recognize Taiwan as a non-NATO ally. Uh, so if I were Chinese and I thought Taiwan were a, 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 an integral part of China, I might think that might be an existential threat to me, or at least to me if I were the leader of China and a lot of other people believe that. So Joe, is that an existential, quote, existential threat? It could, it could easily become one in the sense that if China interpreted it as the way we would interpret, let's say Chinese holding Hawaii away from us. Um, and so they felt they had to go to war and the war escalated to nuclear, that's clearly existential threat. It's symmetrical, both directions. So I did, when I said it's not an existential threat uh, like Hitler, it's not that China is trying to take over the United States, and it's not like we're trying to take over China. Could we do something really stupid and create an existential threat? Absolutely. And then the even harder question, which we maybe will leave to a later panel, is if if we could do something incredibly stupid and are likely to do something incredibly stupid, can smarter people think of any way in which, given the realities of American politics, we could stop short of stupidity. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm leaving it to Tony's next panel. But this gentleman, you've been patient, please. Thank you so much. It's a great conversation. Uh, again, Harry, I'm from a student of Kennedy School. Uh, I have two claims, uh, historical claims, which could be wrong. The first one is China has never claimed or are able to claim hegemony, global hegemony in its thousands of years of history. And the second claim, which could be more controversial, is that China in this history react more towards its uh, uh, external threat and react of, uh, defensively uh, through defensive actions instead of offensively, aggressively outside Chinese border. And uh, my, my question based on these two claims is that uh, can China behave offensively and uh, how would an offensive China would behave from the U.S. perspective? Thank you. Taylor, you've actually written about this, yes. Um, so on your first historical claim, um, 
I guess you'd have to you'd have to ask all the people uh, that were absorbed into various Chinese uh, dynasties, <laughs> um, Qing in particular, for example. Um, um, I don't, you could describe that as a kind of hegemony uh, if you want. Um, but I I think the more pressing question is the second one, and here uh, the real issue is uh, say post forty nine to date. I think you could make the case for a lot of China's uses of force. They were limited to its neighborhood. They were uh, at least from China's standpoint, defensive, even if some of them militarily are quite offensive, such as the devastating invasion of Vietnam in 1979. Um, but China was also quite a weak military power, right? It had no oper it had no means to be offensive. Um, that's changing, and it's changing as as Andrew mentioned quite significantly. I don't. I, I think it's going to take longer for China to have some of the more globally oriented capabilities. Um, but nevertheless. Um, I think one can certainly not discount the possibility, right? Moving far beyond Taiwan, that a much stronger China could see that that it has this great tool in its military power that it could use uh, more effectively than before. And here I'm reminded of the Chinese Civil War. So, the strategy of the Red Army in the Civil War, uh, right, was actually quite defensive in many ways, uh, seeking to conserve strength because it was it feared that it would be wiped out by the nationalists. And Mao had this sort of Three, you know, stage uh, plan, right? The strategic defensive, defensive, the strategic counteroffensive, and the strategic offensive. And as uh, uh, post forty five, right, as the PLA became stronger after it renamed itself, um, right, it certainly went on the offensive with the nationals in quite a significant way uh, when it had the capability to do so. And so I think that's an important lesson for the future. Um, now, are we going to? The question is, at what point in the future would we get uh, to? To a period where China might have these capabilities, um, that's a tough question to answer. I think China sees uh, many, many challenges in becoming a modern military, and I think it has a lot of challenges in becoming a global, a truly global military. Not to say they can't get there, but they're, it's really quite um, challenging. And in the interest of time, I won't sort of go into the reasons, but I wouldn't simply say for these two past observations that we can sort of be, be confident, right, that the future will be sort of harmonious and, and, and peaceful, because I think the, the capabilities you have, um, certainly, right, more broadly speaking, international politics will shape the things you might think you can do. Great. Andrew, quick, brief. I think uh, the PRC needs to do a much better job under Xi of explaining why this truly extraordinary buildup in military capabilities. And for details on that, any day now, uh, the Pentagon should have its 2022 China military power report out in excruciating detail. No document is perfect, but this is kind of a patchwork quilt, but it's a patchwork quilt with uh, some of the best pieces of cloth anyone could ever have, extremely revealing, assembled under the guidance of uh, Dr. Michael Chase, uh, a, a well-known uh, China scholar in his own right. So I'd commend that to people's consideration. And the question is, why won't China more fully address these issues and explain it for the military aficionados out there? Look specifically if uh, the DF-27 and PHL-16 are addressed, these are very significant missile systems. Good, good advertisement for a good product that'll be uh, provocative. The bosses tell us we have four and a half minutes left so I think we're going to take the last two questions, just take this gentleman and the person behind you together to put your questions and then we'll do the panel. And I apologize for the others that are up. Please, sir. Thank you so much for the panel. Uh, my name is Yunjie Zhang. I'm, from the, I'm with the Cypher School. I'm a master's student there. So my question is, uh, what do you think of the idea that um, China is, China's foreign policy is current foreign policy is washing away the center of shame and fending off Western uh, dominance. And what role does that ideology play in the holistic US-China competition view? Good, please. Thank you, panelists. My name is Xu Linjia, a Harvard Kennedy School student coming from a global health background. I have a question for uh, Dr. Nye and the panelists about uh, synergy of China and U.S. soft power and how to leverage that in international development. Thank you. Okay, so who would like to take the first question? 
Well, maybe I should get it. Take the second. Take the second. Give it. I I once wrote an article with Wang Jisu of Peking University about Chinese American soft power, and I pointed out that a soft power, which means attraction, getting what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payment, can be a positive sum game. If we don't have an existential threat to each other, the idea that China becomes somewhat more attractive in American society and America becomes somewhat more attractive in Chinese society is a gain for both of us. Unfortunately, all the trends are running in the other direction of both societies. And I think part of the answer is the role of nationalism. We talked earlier about ideology, but we haven't spent enough time on nationalism. If you look at uh, the century of shame, um, why is it that China harps on this again and again? And the answer is because it plays to Chinese nationalism. And if you ask the question of uh, why is China playing so much on nationalism? It's in terms of the uh, performance legitimacy that we heard about earlier. If you don't get the performance legitimacy you want from the rate of growth, you get it through nationalism. And I would give you an anecdote, which is a classic case of this. China spent a lot of effort negotiating a investment treaty with the European Union just before the Biden administration came into power. The Americans were against it. The Chinese scored a coup by getting this treaty. Some German members of, uh, some, well, they were European members of parliament, uh, criticized China over its human rights policy in Xinjiang. And China essentially then proscribed those EU member, uh, parliamentary members going to China, which meant the EU then said, we're not going to go ahead with the treaty. That's a clear case of shooting yourself in your foot for nationalistic reasons, just like wolf warrior diplomacy was a way to shoot yourself in the foot for nationalistic reason. Wolf warrior doesn't appeal to people overseas. It doesn't increase your soft power overseas. Wolf warrior stimulates your nationalistic impulses at home, and that helps the party maintain control. So I think it, in addition to ideology, you have to think about the effects of nationalism. And I think that answers, to my mind, both the questions. Good. Anybody else want to make a comment? Please. So uh, two decades ago, I had a, an extraordinary experience uh, as an intern at the US Embassy in Beijing. I was supporting a congressional delegation. And as part of that, I had uh, two hours on the Great Wall with then uh, Senator Joe Biden. Um, I've never met a more pro-personal engagement person in my life. Uh, if anyone were into people-to-people -people interaction, discussion, let's talk this through, uh, listening, talking, uh, in my view, it would be Joe Biden, based on my personal experience, what I've seen subsequently seems to be what a lot of people say out of, about him, that he, with his administration, could come to this point two decades later and having this degree of concern about uh, PRC policies under Xi Jinping, I think, uh, speaks volumes. And uh, I, I think it's worth reflecting on in terms of where have we come in U.S.-China relations over the last uh, two, uh, two decades, including uh, collect more collective leadership under Hu Jintao, but especially uh, in the increasingly centralized, top-down, even, uh, dare we say, neo-totalitarian Xi Jinping years. So there are many perspectives and many angles, of course, but there has been a fundamental change on the part of the PRC now under Xi, and I think you can you can see that in the Biden administration's own assessments and policies. Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure on many of the topics if we've come to conclusions, but for sure we've come to the end of this panel. So <laughs> let's say thank you to the members of the panel.